If entrepreneurship be the food of love, build on. That's right, to celebrate Valentine's Day, we're going to talk all about falling in love and getting into the right relationship with your product. Speaking of relationships, if you want to start a mentoring relationship up, why not check out My Mentor Path, a free mentorship platform where product managers and product leaders can connect with each other and get the support they need to grow in their careers. You can head over to MyMentorPath.com to find out more about the benefits of mentoring to both sides of the relationship and sign up to be a mentor, a mentee, or both. You can check the show notes out for more details. All right, back to the episode and the discussion about finding problems that really matter and not just solutions that sound cool. How can we identify these problems? How do we know when to double down and when to give up? And how do we know when we've reached the promised land of product market fit? For answers to all these questions and many more, stick with us on One Night in Product. So my guest tonight is Uri Levine. Uri is a multiple entrepreneur, public speaker, mentor, author, and proud disruptive father of two unicorns, including the now Google-owned collaborative navigation platform Waze, making Uri the perfect person to ask about roadmaps. Nowadays, Uri is doing his best to help the next generation of entrepreneurs navigate their startups through tricky traffic with his speaking, his online publication, Startups, as well as his new book, Fall in Love with the Problem, Not the Solution, a book with which he aims to empower you to build a successful business by identifying your customers' biggest problems and disrupting the inefficient markets that currently serve them. Hi, Uri. How are you tonight? Excellent. Thank you. So, first things first, you said in your book that people often ask you whether selling ways for 1.15 billion in 2013 was the right decision. So, I have to ask, was selling ways for 1.15 billion in 2013 the right decision? You know, for a second, I would say they are right decisions or no decisions, because when you make a decision, you wouldn't know what it would be like if you'll choose a different path, right? Yep. And and in many cases, you look back and you say that was a mistake. But back then, no one knew that. So at the time, when Waze was acquired by Google, that was the highest price ever paid for an application. And it was by the only competitor that we actually had, Google Maps at the time. And so we thought it's the right decision. And obviously, we made that decision. Occasionally, you know, you might want to think of uh, other examples throughout the history, right? Taking Google, for example. We don't think of Google as a company that ever struggled, but they did struggle at the beginning and they had a very hard time and they were unable to raise capital. And they approached Yahoo and asked Yahoo to acquire them for $2 million, not $2 billion, <laughs> not $2 trillion, $2 million, right? And Yahoo said no. And you look at it today and you say, big mistake, right? We actually don't know that. We don't know what would have happened if they would have said yes. So in your life, when you make a decision, that's the right decision by definition. There you go. It's more important to make a decision or as they say in military terms, attack the left hill, attack the right hill, but don't just walk between the hills, right? You've got to make exactly some kind of decision. But I remember reading Build by Tony Fidel recently, which is a great book where he talks about the trials and tribulations of being acquired by Google and the shenanigans that came with it. And normally when I see a company, for example, like Waze get purchased by a big company, I'd expect at least some of the leadership, maybe the founders, to have the golden handcuffs clicked straight on, you know, earn out periods, all these KPIs, and they can't really move on until they get to these certain benchmarks. But you left Waze straight away. So is it fair to say that you're not really a big company kind of guy and you just wanted to get onto the next startup? You know, I'm a troublemaker, right? So if I would, uh, um, I would be fired from any corporate that I will join, right? Because eventually <laughs> I'm going to say, no, no, it doesn't work that way, right? Or whatever we are currently doing is wrong. We need to do it completely different. And then, so I'm a troublemaker. I will eventually get fired. In this case, I'm a startup guy, right? So I was already in the process of building new startups. And um, when the acquisition came, that was awesome opportunity for me to leave. And I literally left the day after. So I can build uh, more startups. But where do you think that comes from? I mean, is there anything in your account, like that? You know, has this been something that's always been there, like since you were a child? Something that you've always had, like a passion to build new things, or was that something that you kind of developed once you got into the or onto the career ladder and started to realize how companies worked? So I was always a troublemaker, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that not taking things for granted. Uh, challenging everything, looking at different perspective, 
getting frustrated and not and holding on to it. So it's not that I'm going to give up on that. Uh, wait a minute. There is no way that this is how stuff is working. Right? Let me try to figure out a way to address that. It was always there, right? Um, now, I actually did the first move into an independent startup only in when I in year 2000, when I was already 35. And because before that, I was most of my career at Converse Technology, and Converse was growing pretty good. And, and at the time, there was a lot of room for internal innovation, so something that we might want to call start in. Yeah. And I was building some of those. And, uh, and then I decided that this is uh, really time for me to move on and start to build my own stuff. Well, you've definitely done that. And obviously, Waze was a massive success, a unicorn that you then moved on from. But then you moved on to, notably, another company, Move It a public transportation app, which you helped to set up. And then that got acquired by Intel for another cool billion. So that's like two unicorns that you've been involved in now. So I do have to ask, where should I be putting my money for your third unicorn? You should, because I'm, uh, I'm building multiple startups, right? So you're looking at one and I'm saying, no, they're going to be multiple of those. So you're going to, how, how many unicorns do you think you're going to be going for by the end? Like, you know, when you finally get bored of all this stuff, how many unicorns do you want to have in the paddock? I have five kids. So five unicorns. Five sounds like a good number to me. There you go. Watch this space. But obviously, apart from being involved in these other companies, helping them out, giving the benefit of your experience, getting involved in the dirty work, no doubt, you've also got your new book, Fall in Love with the Problem, Not the Solution. So what spurred you to write that book and why now? So um, end of the day, they are two very strong personalities that I actually have. One of them is an entrepreneur, and that one everyone knows, right? Yeah. The other one is actually being a teacher. And so I will feel equally rewarded if I build stuff myself or I guide someone else to build it. And I mentor most of my CEOs in the 10 different startups that they have and guide them and help them and coach them. And um, teaching at some of the universities here in Tel Aviv occasionally, entrepreneurship and so forth. And I realized that Fulfilling my destiny as a teacher is actually writing the book. And in that sense, I can share my know-how, which is rather unique because in general, I would say most of the entrepreneurs are not teachers, right? And most of the teachers are not entrepreneurs. Yep. And so when you, when you have the combination, you end up with writing a book about know-how and not about theory, right? And, and the difference between in theory and in reality is way bigger in reality than it is in theory. And I think that if I can take that all that and share that with entrepreneurs or business people or um, managers or anyone, actually, this is going to make them better. And if I can increase their likelihood of being successful, then I did my share. Ah, but these people are going to compete with your unicorns, though, right? What are you going to do about that? I hope they will win. Oh, there you go. You've got to throw your body on the grenade. But obviously, you've been writing before this on your blog, doing a lot of speaking and all of that stuff. So that kind of talks a lot to your general goal of teaching and helping out. But I've got to say that writing a book, I mean, it's quite an undertaking, right? It's not an easy thing to do. And of course, if you're working with all these other companies, I'm assuming you're pretty busy as well. You've got your kids to talk to as well. So like, there's a lot of stuff going on. And then you've got this book. So was that like an easy process to make time for and to just sort of smash the book out? Or did it take a lot of effort and revision? And was it a lot of sort of blood, sweat and tears to actually get a book that you could be proud of? Absolutely blood, sweat and tears. Um, for a second, I would say <laughs> I actually wrote an article about why writing a book is similar to building a startup, right? So you go on, on a journey. And at the beginning, you don't know exactly where it's going to end. And it's going to be a long journey. It's going to be a roller coaster journey. And in many cases, it's going to be a journey of failures, right? So there are chapters that I actually wrote and then erased or paragraphs, realizing that it does not deliver the message that I wanted or it does, but this is, uh, shouldn't be on a book or, or different aspects. And, and it was a long journey. The good news is I was traveling quite a lot before COVID and then COVID hit and, uh, and pretty much airplane were grounded, right? So people actually. Not a lot happened to them, but airplanes were granted. And the result is that I was unable to travel and I found the right time to write the book. It was about one year of writing it and another year of iterations, 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 iterations. Um, and now it's, uh, uh, it gets published. 
Oh, there you go. And I'm looking forward to the outtake book as well, so we can see all the bits that you left out. Or maybe that can be the beginning of book two. But you got a forward in the book from Steve Wozniak, co-founder of Apple, of course, who speaks very glowingly about the book. So I have to ask, you know, I mean, Steve Wozniak's been around the block a few times. Seems like it's a pretty big deal to impress someone like that with a book about entrepreneurship. Like, how did you meet Steve? So you're right, right? So, so the first time that I approached him, he wrote the first chapter that I sent him and say, wow, I wish I had that when I started. And then later on, he oh, wow. actually fell in love with the book itself. But we have met before. We have met at a couple of conferences that we both us, uh, spoke. And he really liked my presentation. And um, he actually happened to be on one of the chapters of the book, and the chapter that speaks about understanding users. Uh, with a story from the first time that we have met. And, uh, you know, for me, Steve Wozniak was a real guru of, of technology, and he is the one that actually was there to build Apple. And uh, and I was in the in the age that that was pretty much nearly the only one. And we met at a conference, and I um, uh, we had dinner the night before the conference, and I wanted to have a selfie with him. <laughs> and I used my iPhone, right? So on the iPhone... You can click on the screen in order to take a picture, or you can use the volume button on the side, right? Yep. And so I was holding the phone like that and clicking on the side of the of the of the phone in order to take a picture. And he said, "Finally," and I said, "Finally, what?" He said, "Finally, someone <laughs> using it the way that I meant it to be." There you go. And then there is a whole chapter in the book that speaks about why users are different, right? And it's really challenging because when you use something you tend to believe that this is the only way to use it, right? But if you will watch other people, all of a sudden you would realize that, wait a minute, there are other people that might be using a product differently and might be perceiving a problem differently. And they're actually different people than you and their ability to adapt new products is, is way different than yours, right? And now if you're a building product, perhaps the most important thing that you need to realize is that you need to watch users and you need to watch them for the first time in their life using your product. And if they're not doing what you expect, then ask them why. Yeah, and there's also this idea that they're not wrong for doing that as well, right? Like it's, it can be really eye-opening, I agree, like just even talking to people, but also watching them to see like what they're doing with the perfect little flower that you created and seeing all the things that they click that you didn't think that they were going to click and all the things that they're doing with it that you didn't think that they were ever going to do with it. And it's just... It's absolutely fascinating, but I think also there's a real... So let me interrupt here, right? You are more concerned about those that are not doing what you wanted them to do, not those that are overdoing. Yeah. Those that are simply not doing because they haven't figured out that this is what they need to do. No, absolutely. But in any case, absolutely agree that it's important to watch people and talk to people. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a sec about the book as well. But on the book, it's obvious book promotion question time. What is the core value proposition of this book? Who should read it and why? So very simple. It's going to increase your likelihood of being successful. That's it. As simple as that. And all the entrepreneurs in the world, everyone that works in a, in a startup, everyone that deals with innovation, all the managers and business people in the world, everyone in the high-tech industry. That's a decent-sized, total addressable market there. Hopefully some of them are listening to this. But the book talks about falling in love with the problem and not the solution. Obviously, that's the title and how you're looking to change entrepreneurs' mindsets with the book. So this assumes that many people out there are currently falling in love with the solution, not the problem. Otherwise, I guess you probably wouldn't have to write the book. So why do you think in this day and age, because you're not the only person saying this, of course, in this day and age, people are still getting it the wrong way around? I don't know why, right? Because um, <laughs> the, the reality is that there are a lot of people that would start with the solutions. And, and my recipe will start with something else. Think of a problem, a big problem, something that it's really worth solving. And then ask yourself, who has this problem? Now, if you happen to be the only person on this pro in the world with this problem, then I would say, you know what? Go to a, a psychologist. It's going to be way easier to deal with the problem. <laughs> than to actually building a startup. But if a lot of people have this problem, what you really want to do next is go and speak with those people and understand their perception of the problem and only then go and build the solution. Now, if you follow this path and your solution works, it's guaranteed that you are creating value. If you start with the solutions, you might be building something that no one cares and that is going to be really frustrating. 
So all the journeys of entrepreneurship, all the journeys of building startup is about value creation. If you create value, you will be successful. And solving problem is the easiest way to figure out value because if, if you solve someone's problem, you create value. Now, in general, I would say, if you fall in love, in, by the way, what really happens is that when you speak with a lot of people, usually what's going to happen is that they're either going to disqualify the problem and tell you, I don't have this problem, or, or I, never, I never heard of someone that actually had this problem. And this is going to be disqualifications of your idea very fast. But in a lot of cases, the acknowledgement is going to empower you because people will start to tell you their version of the problem. And when this happened, you feel like they are sending you on a mission to solve that problem. And your mission, and this is, by the way, where you fall in love with the problem. Now, when you fall in love with the problem, two things happen. Number one is problem serves as the North Star of your journey. And we, when you have a North Star, you are way more likely to get somewhere and you are going to have less deviations. And of course, you will have deviations, right? Even with the North Star, there are some nights that are cloudy, right? And so yep, this is where you'll need to figure out your path well on yourself. But what it's also going to make it, the, the problem is going to make your storytelling way easier and way more compelling, right? So if we will be here in 2007 and I will tell you I'm going to build an AI-based crowdsource navigation system, then you're going to tell me, oh, this is really interesting, but you don't care. <laughs> yep. If I will tell you I'm going to help you to avoid traffic jams, then you do care. And so the problem story is the one that creates better engagement with everyone, right? With your customers, with your investors, with your hiring people. Everyone is going to associate it with the problem. And then the story that everyone tells is very different, right? So if someone will ask you, what is your company doing? You'll say, this is the problem we are solving, right? Or this is the value we are creating for you rather than our system is whatever you want, right? And so our system is based on solution, the problem we are solving based on the problem. And this is the value that we create for you, focus on you, which is even better than both. Do you think, though, that there are some industries out there which this is legitimately prevalent in? So, for example, I'm thinking of something like Web3, which obviously has its detractors, it has its promoters, and it has people that are in love with it, you know, almost almost in love with it for being Web3. And there's this kind of identity around it and this idea that you're kind of in a club. So do you think that in certain situations, whilst obviously there's still a problem that you need to solve with your technology, that in some cases the very technology itself can be almost part of the wider problem or the, the space that you're existing in in people's minds? So at the end of the day, I would ask, so what are people doing with it, right? Because if you want something to create value, and, you know, in this example, or even if you would take blockchain as an example, right, it's technology that you can do many things, but up until now, no one has figured out where is it creating value, right? Yep. And so for me, it's going to be the use case and not the technology. And even if we think of um, chat GPT, then for a second, I would say, this is awesome, right? But what's the use case, right? Now, if you'll tell me, you know what, I'm going to reduce cost of all customer care in the world because I now can do that very fast and, and easier and better. Okay, this is use case. This is awesome. I agree. By the way, I do agree. If you'll tell me this is going to save tons of time for students to write uh, their jobs, their, their you know seminars or whatever, I agree, but it doesn't serve the purpose of learning, right? So, so it's going to be the use case that is going to determine everything. And, and the use case is basically fall in love with the problem. Well, you say that building a startup is like falling in love. And that the good news about that is that you're in love. And you don't listen to anyone's warnings. But the, the bad news is that you're in love and you don't listen to anyone's warnings. So how do you know when you found a problem and if you assume that at least at some point you've kind of fallen in love with it, but you've also done some kind of validation on it, but maybe it's starting to go a bit south and you start needing to listen to people's warnings or start understanding maybe where things aren't quite right. Like, how do you know when that type of thing happens? So um, Mark Randolph, one of the co-founders of Netflix, uh, which, by the way, wrote an endorsement to my book as well. Oh, there you go. He wrote a book called This Will Never Work. Yep. 
And when I started to tell ways to people, you know, even to my friends, the, the, first, the first reaction is always the same. This will never work. Now, the reason is that I was incubating this concept in my mind for a long while. And I was actually, until I actually fall in love with that and was ready to go out with that to, to speak to other people. I was thinking about the, the problem and then the solution and then the, the team that I'm going to build around. And I thought about so many multiple perspectives of it that I was ready. When you tell someone, they are not ready. <laughs> and they're, therefore, the first reaction, this will never work. By the way, these were the nice guys, right? The lesser nicer guys, they told me, <laughs> this is the stupidest idea that I ever heard, right? And, uh, and I heard that multiple times. Yep. And the reality is that an entrepreneur, once they fall in love, they don't listen to anyone else. If you would ask an entrepreneur, when is the right time to shut the company down? They will never shut the company down because what the, the company will die eventually, but they will not shut it down. And the reason is different. The most important behavior of an entrepreneur is perseverance, is the never give up attitude, right? So if you have an attitude of giving up, you will not become an entrepreneur. But if you are building something and this is your attitude and you basically believe in the problem and you think that the mission is right, and you will tell yourself, you know what, even if I am going to end up unsuccessful, I would think that the journey was worthwhile to try, then you'll never give up. Well, there you go. Or well, you shouldn't. But obviously, it's no good solving a problem that you only care about. You talked about that yourself, this idea of the kind of sample of one and the fact that you have to go out and talk to people that have that problem. But in the book, you talk about a qualification matrix, which you use, at least in part, to work out whether the idea is a goer, whether it's something that you should go out and solve. So what are some of the elements, aside from finding out a bunch of people, but some of the main elements that you use to make a decision about whether you should tackle a problem or should work with the company to tackle a problem? So the first one, by the way, is also is always your personal perspective, right? If you feel that this is a problem you would like on a personal level to solve, then this is a good start. If you don't think that you care or you have no clue how to address that, then you shouldn't start. Yeah. So the first one is going to be personal qualification, right? The second one is actually looking at uh, two dimensions, as you mentioned. One of them, which is kind of obvious, is the total addressable market, right? So how many people care, right? Or if, if you have an offering for very small niche or very small segment versus a lot of people, right? So drivers, there are about a billion vehicles on the planet, and therefore you can assume that there are maybe 3 billion drivers. And then when you think of public transportation, there are about 5 billion people traveling on public transportation. So obviously, the addressable market is rather large. What is more important than the addressable market is actually how painful the problem is, right? Or how much value you can create by, by eliminating the problem. And the value can be measured by, by two dimensions, right? So one is, is, is really value, right? So maybe this is how much money I'm going to make you, or this is how much money I'm going to save you. This is how much time I'm going to save you, which are measurable in that sense. Or even better than that, the frequency of use, right? So something that is going to be used multiple times or high frequency, then it's obviously going to become valuable. And it's also going to help your marketing strategy at the end of the day. Because if you have something that has high frequency of use, your growth strategy will end up as word of mouth. That's it. Wherever you start, you will end up with word of mouth because there is multiple opportunities for someone to speak about that. If you have low frequency of use, then obviously word of mouth is not going to work for you. And, uh, and, and so this is easier, right? On the second hand, on a side note, I would say that occasionally it's really hard to define the value that you bring. And, and you are not clear about it, right? So what if you make things simpler, right? So what exactly is the value here? What if you create certainty versus uncertainty? So, so your value is actually peace of mind which is really important, but we don't know exactly how to, to measure it or qualify it. And maybe we will need the, the softer dimensions to define that. But at the end of the day, look at this metrics. If you are going to create a lot of value to a lot of people or a lot of customers, you know, these are going to be winners, right? If you create very little value, 
to very few people don't even bother, right? <laughs> the challenge is that most of the startups are somewhere in between, right? They either have high, high addressable market with low value or low addressable market with high value. And um, go for the value, not for the addressable market. If you, can, if you don't create value, you will die anyhow. But do you believe in the old painkiller, vitamin and candy analogy that some people use to almost categorize the problems that you're solving? So, you know, obviously things that, as you say, are very painful, things that need to be sold versus things that are kind of nice to solve. Like, would you personally ever want to go into a company solving a non-painkiller problem? So I always start with a problem that it's worth solving, right? If it's not worth solving, then I don't care, right? Now, it doesn't say that these are not going to be successful. What I'm saying is that they are, they are not for me. Yeah. So I guess someone else can go and solve those ones and, and take their own time to do that. But talking of time, you speak in the book about the long journey of building a startup, building a product, the initial enthusiasm, then the failures that you have up front, then the desert of no traction. Then there's this green shoots that pop up of the maybe zone where maybe it's going to work out. Then there's the product market fit stage, and then hopefully up into the stratosphere well on the way to being your third or fourth unicorn. So you've had an idea, you're in love with it, you're going through the journey. How long should you expect to stay in that maybe phase or you know, maybe even in the failure and the despair stage before you start to get some traction? Like, What's a decent amount of time to spend in that phase? So whatever you think, way more. <laughs> and, and, and here is the challenge, right? And, and for a second, I would say, look, your journey is going to start, and the journey has uh, building a startup has multiple phases, right? So think of a corporate on one side and a startup on the other side. So the corporate have a product, they have identified their users, they know exactly how much the user, the customers are paying for that. So they figure out product market fit, they figure out growth strategy, and they figure out business model. And each one of them is going to be a long journey by itself. And when you go into the journey, let me define the journey of a startup the following way, right? This is going to be a long roller coaster journey of failures. And each one of them is important, right? So roller coasters with ups and downs, you know, all the businesses in the world have ups and downs, but the frequency of those in a startup could be a few times a day. And I think that uh, Ben Horvitz from uh, the venture capital firm and Reese and Horvitz has the best quote on that. He used to be a CEO of a startup before he actually became a venture capitalist. And he was asked whether or not he was sleeping well at night as a CEO of a startup. And he said, oh, yeah, I slept like a baby. I woke up every two hours and cried. That's really the reality. <laughs> and the most important realization is that this is going to be a journey of failures, right? So we're trying to build something new that no one did before. And even though that we have the conviction that we know exactly what we are doing, the reality is that we don't. So we try. We try one thing and it doesn't work. We try another thing and we keep on trying different things until we find one thing that does work. Now, the reality is that if you realize that this is going to be a journey of failure, then there are two conclusions, right? Number one is if you're afraid to fail, then in reality, you already failed because you're not going to try. Albert Einstein used to say that if you haven't failed, that because you haven't tried new things before. If you're going to try new things, you will fail. Yep. The second one, which is even more important, is that you need to fail fast. Because the faster that you fail, you actually have enough time to make another attempt. And at the end of the day, look, if you are standing at, uh, at half court on, on a basketball court and trying to, to uh, shoot and make a basket, if you have one attempt, you're very likely to miss. But if you have 50 attempts, one of them you're going to make. That's the analogy. That is really, really important. The more, the faster that you fail, the more time that you actually have for the next attempt. Now, the first part of the journey, you need to figure out product market fit. And product market fit is creating value to your customers. If you don't figure out product market fit, you will die. As simple as that. In fact, we never heard of a company that did not figure out product market fit. They simply died. That's it. But when you think of companies that did figure out product market fit, you realize that, wait a minute, they did not change their value proposition since they figured that out, right? So just imagine, think of all the applications that you're using every day, right? So, so being uh, searching on Google, using Waze, using WhatsApp, using Uber, watching Netflix, whatever it is, and ask yourself, what is the difference between any of those that I'm using today 
in the first time that you have used that? And the answer is that there is no difference. We are searching Google today the same way that we search Google for the first time in our life. We are using Uber or WhatsApp or Waze the same way that we did it for the first time in our life. And so once you figure out product market fit, you don't change that anymore. You go to the other parts of the journey, which is about increasing your addressable market, figuring out growth, figuring out business model, right? So how do you going to make money, right? And each one of them is going to be, again, a journey of failures. Now, in fact, if you look at uh, many of the tech giants of the world, right? So look at maybe Netflix and, uh, um, and Google and Amazon that are about 25-ish years old, right? Or even younger companies, right? So Tesla and Facebook and, uh, and uh, Airbnb and, and Stripe and so forth. And they are about 15 years old. Yeah. A little bit more than that. And ask yourself how much of their aggregated value of all those companies together was created in the first decade of their existence versus rest of the time. Now, rest of the time, in some cases, it's 15 years. In some cases, it's only five or six or seven years. Right? And you realize that it's less than 10% created on the first decade. Most of the value created after they figure out product market fit and growth and business model, and then they were on the takeoff run. And this is where the value was created. So it's a long journey. If you th ask yourself, how long should you, should you stay in this desert of no traction? Until you figure it out or until you die. Well, one way or the other. But with regards to product market fit, I think it's a really interesting point because I've spoken to some people on the podcast and just on social media and all these places where all the thought leaders like to hang out. And they were, they're often saying things like, well, product market fit isn't a useful concept anymore. Product market fit is dead. Some people that are saying that they work for companies that lost product market fit, speaking to some people saying that they don't know how to measure it and it's more of a feeling than a measurable, actionable thing that you can aim for. But you in the book say that you can measure it and you're very specific about that. So in response to some of these people that are saying that, that you can't measure it, that it is something that is kind of just almost ephemeral, how do you measure that and what are the steps that you need to or what do you need to optimize for to know that you have it? So we define product market fit as creating value to your customers, right? Or to your users, whatever it is, right? And, uh, um, and it's really simple, right? If you're going to create value, they will come back. And so the only metrics that measure uh, product market fit will be retention. That they are coming back. If they don't come back, that means that you're not valuable for them. Now, the challenge with figuring out product market fit is that there is an underlining assumption about the user that they're going to use the product and obtain the value, and therefore they will come back, right? But between use the product and obtain the value, there is a huge gap of, number one, trying to figure out what exactly is the value, because in many cases, um, you have downloaded an app or start to use something because someone told me, someone told you that, oh, you should try this, right? And so you go into this app, you download the app, you invoke it for the first time in your life, and you have no clue what to do with it. And most of us belongs to the segments of users that we will call them the early majority, and we are afraid of changes, right? So I didn't figure out at the second, the first second what to do with it. And I'm going back to my comfort zone, which was exactly what I did before, right? So not using it. Yeah. So the first challenge will be understanding the, where the value, what the value is. The second challenge is going to be, let's get to the value, right? So the transition or this, the complexity of the app is going to dictate for many people if they are going to figure out, uh, um, you know, how to get to the value, right? So, so just for example, if you have a registration on your product because it's really important and you ask people to register with their email and phone numbers and, and whatever, before they even got to the value, many people are going to give up right there, right? So they don't even know why they are giving you this information and they don't want to give you this information. And therefore, they will say, okay, you know what? I was doing just great yesterday. Let me continue that. <laughs> and so getting to the value is going to be a second challenge. And only once you get to the value, then the, whether or not there is enough value in that. So, so this funnel of users 
is the only methodology that you need in order to figure out product market fit. And all the time you need to improve the funnel. So if you bring 100 users on top, you really would like to go to end up with 30 or 40 uh, users retain and keep on using the product, right? And so that means that you will need to address each and every gate or, or challenge by itself. And in most cases, by the way, a lot of people think that they are going to add more features and therefore they're going to make the product more usable. I would say, no, it's the other way around. You need to remove features in order to make it simpler. And just think of, uh, I'll, I'll give you two examples here. So, so the first one is, Think of all the applications that you are using every day, right? And ask yourself, how many features have you used today? And the answer is going, usually going to be one or two. And that's about it, right? Yep. And the reality, and, and this is a story that I heard about LinkedIn. I, I think it's right, but I have no clue. And I've used that story because it served my purpose. So, so even if it's <laughs> inaccurate for a second, let's assume that it is. And the story goes that, uh, um, you know, when LinkedIn started, they had a list of 30 features that they say, this is the, this is the product, right? And when they started to meet more people, more people told them, look, 30 features is way too complex. Let's narrow it down. And they ended up with a list of 10 features that they said, we cannot even launch the product without those 10 features. Obviously, later on, they launched the product and the company turns out to be very successful. And the company went public about a decade after they started. And when they went public, how many of those 10 features were actually developed? And the answer is one. Just one. (laughs) And so obviously, um, in most cases, we need very few features in order to make it work. And everything else is actually not just not needed. It's actually interfering with the simplicity and creates complexity. Now, I'm not sure exactly what is this feature and what is this feature. And you just prevented me from getting to the value. Yeah, I mean, that's, you're you're not the only person to say that, like the idea about simplicity and stuff. And I I do get it. And I think it's important to make sure that you're focusing on the essential. I guess a lot of what you've just spoken about, though, does feel very mass market B2C. So like something that you can give people to download and the users are the same people that are buying it. And it feels that there's like a different story there for some of these startups that are maybe serving the enterprise or serving larger companies with different buyers and different users and maybe these concepts of I mean obviously there's still a sales funnel but like the kind of the activation and the referral stuff maybe starts to melt away a bit do you think that there's a uh, I don't know like a a motivational message that we can give to the b2b product people out there that there's something that they can cling on to as well oh absolutely you know we we would like to say that b2b is different but it's not End of the day, what you're telling me is that, wait a minute, I have three different users, right? I have the, the finance department and, the, um, and then another department and another department. Each one of them needs one feature in order to make it happen, right? If they don't have that specific features, they don't care. And if they have more features, they don't care either because at the end <laughs> of the day, they are going to use very few capabilities. And what you really need to do is make sure that those capabilities are actually good enough, good enough for them, deliver them the value, and then they will keep on using. Now, the metrics is going to be the same. In B2B, when, when customer pays, the metric is renewals, right? So if you don't renew your agreement, that means that there is no value for you. And I don't care if there is no value because you were unable to get to the value. I've overcomplicated it. Or there is simply no value. You don't solve a real problem for them or you don't address a real pain for them. Uh, But at the end of the day, if you create value for them, they will renew. And now in many cases, because you are trying to sell to multiple parts of the organizations, you might need to have customer success that helps uh, uh, the different parts of the organizations to figure out how to use the product and guide them and, and, and teach them how to use the product. It might be a way more complex more complex process, more complex sales, longer time to get the entire, you know, corporate to obtain the value. But from the essence point of view, it's the same thing. So we're going to fall in love with the problem so that they can fall in love with our solution. That's the end goal, right? So hopefully we can exactly get some product people thinking about that sort of thing. 
But where can people find you after this if they want to find out more about the history of ways, uh, how to be more disruptive, or just find out a little bit more about the new book? So, um, you know, obviously, for a second, I would say read the book. And the, and the book, uh, <laughs> the book right now is in Amazon US, and it will be on Amazon UK and rest of the stores in the UK from the middle of the month, so two weeks from now. Yep. And uh, my website, uridavin.com, can refer you to the right place for that. And in that sense, look, the more people actually read the book, I fulfill my destiny in the sense that I want to create more value. I want to become even more valuable than than with ways and with everything else. And the book is about value creation. So I'm fulfilling my destiny here. Oh, there you go. That's a that's an aspirational aim and hopefully we can get a few people to come in your direction and pick up the book and find out more. Well, that's been a fantastic chat. So obviously really glad we could spend some time falling in love with the problems. Obviously wish you the best of luck with the book. Hopefully we can stay in touch. But yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you. Absolutely. As always, thanks for listening. I hope you found the episode inspiring and insightful. If you did, again, I can only encourage you to pop over to onenightinproduct.com, check out some of my other fantastic guests, sign up to the mailing list or subscribe on your favorite podcast app and make sure you share with your friends so you and they can never miss another episode again. I'll be back soon with another inspiring guest, but as for now, thanks and good night.